Okay, everyone. Welcome to Math 347. Now, the official title of this course is Fundamental Mathematics, but as always, mathematicians aren't very good at naming things, and so this course has a better name, and that's Introduction to Proofs. That's really how I'm going to refer to the class throughout. This is Lecture 1, which I titled Introduction, so if you like, this is an Introduction to Introduction to Proofs. Okay, now what is this course all about? Basically, one of the main things in this course is that you're going to learn to prove mathematical statements. And there is no part two. That's it, that's the course. We're not really gonna be doing anything else. Now that's, there's a lot to that. That's a complicated thing and we're gonna spend a whole semester on it, but that's really the thing that we're doing. Okay, so of course, all, what is a proof? One definition of a proof that, that, that we're going to use in this class is, is a mathematical proof is an argument considered acceptable by mathematicians to convince someone else a certain mathematical statement is true. There's a lot of words in this definition and there's a lot of phrases that are doing a lot of work. So first of all, notice I'm talking about a mathematical proof and not some other type of proof. Obviously it's a math class, so we're focusing on that. But I want to keep, I want to put on some crucial things in this definition. The first is that we say that we only consider arguments that are considered acceptable by mathematicians. That's not really a well-defined thing. There's a cultural aspect to it. There's a professional aspect to it as mathematicians. And so part of this course is just sort of training you in the culture and in what's considered standard operating procedure in mathematics. The other thing I really want to point out is that a proof is an argument designed to convince someone else that a statement is true. So by its nature, mathematics is a social activity. It doesn't exist in the real world in any strong sense. It only exists in our heads. And the only way that we can actually do mathematics is to convince other people that something that we've proven is true. So in that, it is important to note that mathematics is absolutely something that is about communication and is about convincing others. Now here's how a proof is written, or at least how we'd like to think a proof is written. Someone gives us a statement. We look at it, we say, I know what to do. Logic, logic, some more logic, compute something. And then boom, that's the argument, QED. For the record, QED is what we sometimes write at the end of proofs. It, QED is just an acronym that stands for Quota Rot Demonstrandum, which if you like is Latin for, see, look, I've showed you. Now here in reality is how a proof is written. We come up with some idea or maybe we observe a pattern and then we make a conjecture, right? A conjecture is sort of an educated guess. It's like a theory in science. It's a sort of a precise statement of, of something that we think is true and that we'd like to prove. But once we make that conjecture, there's still a lot of work to be done. First of all, we have to decide if it's true. So a lot of times once we've made the conjecture, we test a bunch of cases, plug in certain variables, test, test, test. Uh oh, I found a counterexample. My conjecture was wrong. Oh, I need to refine it somehow. So the thing I said, it wasn't quite right. Let me refine it a certain way. Once we get a refined conjecture that we actually believe, then we try to prove it. But then there's a whole category, there's a whole sort of grab bag of tools that we're gonna have when we actually try to prove something. Okay, and, and we'll talk about these in the course that involve direct proof, contrapositive, contradiction, induction, there's all these different things that we'll do. You'll see those words again and again and again. And I want to stress, this is really what the course is about. Not so simple as how do you prove things, but how do you take a statement, make it precise, play with it, work with it, make it work, and then figure out how to get the argument right. Okay, and this isn't, this isn't sort of a scientific process where you just go step by step. There's a little bit of an art to it as to knowing what you should try to prove, what you can prove, how those all feed back into each other. So here's an example. Let's do the following computation. Let's consider the function n squared plus n when n is an integer. And we just start plugging in values, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth. And we plug in a bunch of errors. Well, we're testing something, right? And we notice a pattern. Notice that whatever we plug in on the left side of n, n squared plus n is always even. So now we're in the position to make a conjecture is that n squared plus n is even for any n. Note that this table is not a proof of the statement, right? And we'll be very careful about what's a proof and what's not a proof. This is just, this is not a proof. It's just a collection of examples. However, it gives us, a, it's, we see a pattern. It gives us a good guess, 
which is that this thing is always even. Okay, so again, our conjecture is going to be n squared plus n is even for any n. So how would we prove that? Well, I'm going to show two ways we might prove this, and I'm going to skip a couple of details because some of these things we'll be working on later in the course. By the end of the course, everything in here will be something that is considered a valid proof as far as we're concerned. So one proof is just to say, well, look, I, I see this function n squared plus n. I can factor that, and that's n times n plus 1. And then I can observe that's the product of two consecutive integers, right? It's a number and then the next number times each other. Okay. Well, one thing about two numbers in a row is that always one of them is even and one of them is odd. Right? If the first one's even, the second one's odd. If the first one's odd, the second one's even. So I always have an odd number times an even number. And it turns out, here's a rule that we're going to be able to prove later in the course, is odd times even is always even. And that's it. That's a proof. This thing is always an odd number times an even number, and therefore it's an even number. Another completely different proof is if we happen to know even more facts, we don't actually have to do the factorization, right? In, in proof one, the factorization would make it a little bit simpler. But more generally, we could just sort of attack this head on if we just happen to know the following facts, that odd times odd is odd, odd plus odd is even, even times even is even, and even plus even is even. And again, if it's not obvious to you that those are true, we're going to work with these very much. By the end of this course, this will be, it'll be very clear in your head exactly what these rules are and why they're true. And now let's just go through the argument. And this is sometimes called a proof by cases because n can be odd or even. Well, if n is odd, n squared is odd because odd times odd is odd. And then n squared plus n is odd plus odd, which is even. Similarly, if n is even, then n squared is even because even times even is even. Therefore, n squared plus n is even plus even, which is also even. So this is, this is called proof by cases because we've broken it up into two cases, but either case gives us an even number. That's also a valid proof. We'll do many proofs like that. All right, example number two. So here's a nice conjecture. It looks like maybe it fell into our lap, but let's just look at it. And it says that n squared plus n plus 41 is prime for every integer n. Well, let's go ahead and start computing. So I plug in 0, 1, 2, 3, and so forth, and I get these numbers, 41, 43, 47, all, all the way down, and you can check these numbers are correct. And then I start going through these numbers, and I notice 41 is prime, 43 is prime, 47 is prime. Look at this. All of these numbers are prime. So is the conjecture true? There's a lot of evidence that it is, okay? Um, but there's also a lot of evidence, there, there's also a lack of evidence, right? That because we've only checked 10 numbers, there's more than 10 numbers. So it could certainly be false. So here's the real question. Right, right now, would you bet $10 that it's true? Think about it. Okay, it turns out it's not true. Um, and one way you can see this very easily is that if you take this function, if you take 41 and you plug it in for n, then you get 41 squared plus 41 plus 41. I can pull out a factor of 41 out of there and use the distributive law, and that's 41 times 43. That's certainly not prime. So do not take that bet. Okay, now the last topic we're going to talk about in this lecture, and this is going to lead to our, our class exercise, and that is what is a definition? Or if you like, what is the definition of a definition? Okay, so in the world of, of when people think about this in philosophy and they, they think about what is really a definition, they basically break up everything into two universes, and those are what are called intentional or analytic definitions and extensional or, or exemplary definitions. Basically, analytic definitions are, are definitions that tell us, you know, the essence of an object and its properties, maybe, whereas the exemplary definitions, the extensional definitions, give us examples or, or, or collections that, that allow us to figure out what the, what the pattern is. Inside intentional, there's two very common types of definition we use in mathematics. The first one is the genus and differentia type of model. Uh, the second one is algorithmic. In the extensional world, there's typically things called ostensive and enumerative. An ostensive definition is a definition where I basically give you a collection of examples and I put the onus on you to figure out what I'm thinking of a pattern. And enumerative is I just list everything. And the list is itself the definition. So we're saying that, you know, the things in this set are whatever we're talking about and the things not in the set are not. So let's just give some, some very specific examples here. A prime number is a number that is divisible by itself, only divisible by itself, and one. That's a genus and differentia. So genus means family. So the first thing we do is we say a prime number is a number. So that's step one. And then step two is 
but not all numbers, we make a differential between some numbers and other ones. This type of definition has a strong advantage of being very precise, but it has a weakness that we always have to have a definition for the larger class that sits inside. So this definition always begs another definition. In other words, we can't define prime number without defining number. Algorithmic is an example where we actually write down a definition and that allows us to determine all of the examples in that set. So for example, when we say a perfect square is a number that is the square of an integer, well, not only does that tell us what it is, it also allows us to compute all of them. I can list all the perfect squares. because I just take one squared, two squared, three squared, four squared, dot, dot, dot. I can get all of them from the definition. An ostensive example is something we actually use in mathematics all the time. If you've ever seen the phrase roster notation for a set, that's the cano canonical example of what I'm thinking of here. So for example, let's just take a set where we take 1, 1 4th, 1 9th, 1 16th, 1 25th, and so forth. Well, the and so forth is doing a lot of work. I'm putting the owners on you. You have to see the pattern and figure out what I'm talking about. But in this case, I think everybody can see, what I've done is I've just taken one over the perfect squares. And so it's clear where that pattern goes. And then finally, enumerative, like I said, is a definition. It gives a list that gives the definition itself. So for example, the schools in the Big Ten are, you know, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, list all the schools in the Big Ten. The schools in the Big Ten that we've just listed, those are the ones that are in. Every other school is not. And that's it. So now in class, we'll go on to the class activity.